So I'm Eva Freed. I'm the clinical director for the nurse midwifery program and the women's health nurse practitioner program. And I'm here representing the whole program. We also have a program director who's not with us tonight, but there'll be photos and names for um, everybody coming up in the slide set. Um, Caitlin, I see you next. Hey everybody, I'm Caitlin Rivard and I am a clinical advisor for the WHNP and CNET programs. I focus mostly on the students kind of east of the Mississippi, um, but I have an excellent counterpart, Katie Graves, who does the West, the Midwest and the West. So we are here to answer any questions regarding your clinical experience. Welcome. And then I saw Brittany and Quincy, or sorry, jump in, Richard. I saw you next. Yeah, hello, everybody. My name is Richard Kolke. I'm uh, here on behalf of the admissions team, and I'll be helping with the chat, and I will uh, start responding to some of those questions, but glad to have everybody here. Thank you. And Brittany or Quincy, did you want to say hi before I start? chatting away? Oh, sure. Um, I'm Brittany Kinnison uh, in marketing here at Frontier. Nice to meet everyone. And Quincy might be busy, busy managing the slide. So jump in when you get a chance, Quincy, and I hope it's okay with you if I just keep saying next slide, please. <laughs> Sorry, my charger is having issues. Um, okay, I'll go ahead and take the next slide whenever you're ready. That's me, um, and this whole thing is Q&A, so that's why we said, even though we've got some things to share, we're really here to answer your questions. Um, so we're gonna just kind of keep up in the chat as we go through the slides. So I'm gonna answer one that I see in there, and then we'll be able to advance. So I see Shannon asking, what's the likelihood of acceptance into the midwifery program without labor and birth nursing experience? Um, so that will not be a barrier to your overall acceptance, Shannon, and other folks, if you're asking. We have found, though, and this is just being honest, this is not because this is our belief system, this is just the reality of our lived experience. It can be more challenging to get a clinical placement if you don't have that labor and birth experience because midwifery practices have just become really fast-paced and the acuity has changed and it's hard for the midwives who are precepting to teach some things um, that labor nurses just sort of naturally learn, such as cervical exams and using the electronic fetal monitor. So it's not a barrier. You shouldn't like not apply because you don't have labor and birth experience. But if you're able to transition into that role while you're thinking about school or at the beginning of school, I think that's a great idea. We do also offer at this time, it's grant funded, so I can't promise how long it's gonna go on for, but at this time we are indefinitely offering um, a labor skills workshop at no extra cost for folks who are um, not labor nurses who are in the nurse midwifery program. Um, and then I saw the next question says, I plan to do a BSN program, and I understand that I will need to work a year as an RN before applying. Anything else I need to be preparing for? I've been a birth doula for nine years. Um, nope, just meeting the criteria for um, admission, and it looks like you'll be doing that with, I mean, there are some other things like grade point average and stuff, but just looking at your overall game plan there, that looks good. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so our goal at Frontier, and you might already know this, this might be why you're on the call, but if you don't, we're happy to share it with you, is I'm not gonna read this to you word for word, but we um, are the oldest distance uh, nursing and midwifery education program in the country. And part of that is within our mission that it's our goal to help you serve your own community. So um, one of the ways we say that is that, you know, we want to keep you in your own community instead of everybody moves to Kentucky for school. And then there's 5 billion midwives and women's health nurse practitioners in Kentucky that, you know, you come to Kentucky for parts of your program, but you do your clinical rotations and your learning in your home community, because we're guessing you want to serve your home community. That's how you got into this. You're not held to that by any means. It's not like you have to live there for you know a certain number of years or whatever. But that is our mission around distance education. Way before there was even an internet that was accessible to the general public, we were doing distance education for that reason, um, creating healthcare providers in their home communities. I'm going to pop on over uh, 
to the chat and answer a few questions there. I'm going to uh, leave some that I think are for others, but is there a nurse midwifery pathway for current FNPs? Yes, we have a postgraduate certificate program, and that is the appropriate program for anybody who's already an advanced practice nurse. And then the next question from Kelly is, are the classes asynchronous or are there certain times each week we need to log in? Kind of both. Um, but the main situation is that classes are asynchronous. Every term, there will be some synchronous things that you need to do, but you'll have lots and lots of options for when to sign up for those. So it's not like in term one, you're going to have classes every Thursday and you can't work on Thursdays. It's not like that because you can live anywhere in the world with an internet connection during the didactic portion of your program. So you have to do your clinicals in the U.S. and we'll talk more about that. But during the didactic portion of your program, you can be anywhere in the world. So, um, and you can, some people work nights, some people work days, we're in different time zones. So at the beginning of each term in the course, they'll say, oh, we have two simulations or whatever, or two group projects in this course. So you'll need to sign up for time slots that work for you. And some of those will be evenings and weekends. So you'll just be able to find ones that fit in your schedule. Um, I'm going to pop back up here. How does part-time work with scheduling and clinicals? The minimum number of clinical hours. Oh, uh, Caitlin's answering that. Great. The minimum number of clinical hours you have to do is approximately 24 a week. There's some variation. So... Um, you can work during that as well. Um, yes, New York has its own special situation and Caitlin is answering that. Somebody else will answer about the fees. Um, yeah, so Victoria, um, balancing work and school is really important to us. I would say probably a majority of our students work full time during the program. That's more doable for some people than others, depending on you know what kind of work you do, whether it's days or nights, whether you have family responsibilities in addition to that, how far you travel to your work and your clinical site. Um, so it's absolutely doable and it's also demanding. You can expect the clinical experience to take three terms, which is approximately nine months. It's three 14 week terms if you count breaks. Um, and you kind of work that out with your own preceptor. So you'll you'll have to, when you look for clinical, you're looking for things that will also meet your needs. So if you are, you know, you work weekend options, so you can't go to clinical on the weekends and you have to watch your baby on Wednesdays, then you got to find a clinical site that can accommodate that. But that is totally plausible. Um, can I do my clinical time with an OBGYN? Uh, both women's health nurse practitioner students and nurse midwives can do up to 20% of their clinical time with a physician. Um, and, oh, Caitlin and I are tag teaming. So good. Two different lenses. We're getting the same thing. Sorry. No, you're good. We're getting, we're given two different lenses on it. I love it. So Caitlin and I tag team a lot. We have similar roles in the university. Uh, for course scheduling, what does part-time look like? That would be talking to one of the admissions counselors about, um, yeah, and we're, I'm going to answer this too, even though I see that Caitlin did, but um, in, before clinical, that's talking about how many credit hours you're going to take per term um, in terms of your preclinical coursework. Um, okay, I think I've got everybody that was a question for me in the chat. Next slide, please. Kelly, you've got a total of five years to complete the program. I don't recommend taking that long. Um, and you, there are a limited number of terms that you can ta take off. You need to have continuous enrollment in the program. But it's not like a national emergency where you only have 18 months or something like that. Quincy, are you able to give me the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so something else that we're really proud of is the culture of caring at Frontier, and you'll hear about this from the moment you walk in the door, um, and hopefully some of that even translates on Zoom tonight, and that is our culture of caring is really the foundation for everything we do. So this is not, even though this is graduate school and it's hard um, and challenging, it's not a weed out program, it's not that you you know, you come in the door and we're like, somebody here is going to fail. You know, it's not like that at all. We admit you because we think that you can be successful and then we support you in being successful once you're here. Um, as I said a little bit at the very beginning, 
your classroom, your community is your classroom. So um, you will learn primarily in your home community, except for the couple of times that you come to campus um, for skills intensives and orientation. And next slide, please. And then I'll go back about uh, the DNP versus MSN. I'm going to put a pin in that. Um, 100 years of experience. Wow, that's a long time. I didn't really compute, even though I've seen this slide before. That's a long time that we've been doing midwifery education since uh, we were literally on horseback. So I just didn't compute the 100 years before. Um, so like I said, our, our goal about serving um, rural and underserved communities, keeping folks in their home community and doing distance education um, goes way, way back, way before COVID, way before everybody had internet in the house. Um, we've got folks in every single state in the U.S., and we've grown exponentially. We've got uh, close to 3,000 students currently enrolled. Next slide, please. Um, lots of achievements and pretty logos on our website, but these are all real. You have to do real things to get them. Um, and so these are just external organizations that acknowledge the work that we've done and the ways in which we serve uh, graduate students. Next slide, please. So yeah, back to the culture of caring, um, the built-in supports for students. Um, our regional clinical faculty, that's my team. So there are faculty that will be your course faculty while you're in your clinical program, but you'll know us all from the time, the first term that you're enrolled, because we do help you um, put together your clinical plan along with the team that Caitlin's on of clinical advising. We help you develop your plan for clinical from the very beginning. And you will work with clinical preceptors in your own community. Your regional clinical faculty are all nurse midwives, and many of us are also women's health nurse practitioners, um, and we are all over the country. There's 29 of us, um, and we span the whole country, so we often know your community. So we all work from home in our own communities. And then you also have academic advisors, clinical advisors, and again, Caitlin's a clinical advisor who's here with us tonight. We have student mentoring groups by specific interest areas and for specific courses, um, we have in-house financial aid and scholarships in addition to partnering with ones that you can get externally. Library services are amazing here, literally so amazing. Best library support I've ever had as a student or a faculty. Um, and we have an office, a fully staffed office of diversity, equity, and inclusion that hosts student interest groups. I am going to pause here and uh, give us whiplash over to the chat again because I saw some things I want to respond to. So you all have the option to choose a BSN to DNP program or to choose a master's program. And what you're hearing about tonight is a master's program. We don't have a BSN to DNP option, but we do have a post-master's DNP. So you do, you would have to take one term off after clinic, finishing your master's to get a, a final transcript in your master's and apply to the DNP. If you've been successful in your master's program, I can't say that you're guaranteed admission, but you're essentially guaranteed admission in the DNP if you've been successful in your master's program. So you don't, you wouldn't so much need to worry about like, you know, am I good enough to do the doctorate? You would have sort of worked your way towards it. Um, I would say, and this is a much bigger conversation about kind of what are the benefits to getting one or the other, but one of the really big takeaways, the reason that we don't do a straight BSN to DNP is that our goal is to make more clinicians to serve the needs of the people who seek our care. And there isn't any evidence that DNP prepared advanced practice nurses have better care outcomes. And so by not requiring the DNP, it's consistent with our mission because we're not creating obstacles to practice by having your education cost more and take more time. Now that doesn't mean we don't endorse the DNP, we do. Um, but we don't um, see evidence that it's necessary for people whose intent is to practice, take care of patients, and serve their communities. We don't see differences in healthcare outcomes when individual clinicians are doctorally prepared. Now, we 100% you support pursuing your doctoral degree after your master's, and that will prepare you to be a leader in your community, a leader in your organization where you work and to do a lot of quality improvement initiatives. So there are lots of reasons to do your doctorate, but one of the 
none of those reasons are because there's going to be better outcomes for the folks in your community from your direct care. Now, you might become a leader at a hospital system in your community and create a quality improvement initiative that improves care in your community. So part of it is thinking about what your ultimate goals are and also what's the order of events. We also see that people do more meaningful doctoral work when they've been a clinician for a little while and they kind of know where they see those gaps that need to be addressed. Um, there are not typically pay differences right off the bat. Um, scrolling down, okay, you get to come to campus twice. We mean it about the culture of caring. I endorse that. Uh, we saw about scheduling. Um, yes, you can bring, I think somebody uh, answered this, but you can bring um, an infant to campus regardless of how that infant is being fed. You do need to bring a caregiver and we have family housing on campus. We have high chairs in the cafeteria. Um, I don't know exactly what the cost is, but it's very fair. Um, it's pretty minimal just to cover like the caregivers meals and housing. Um, somebody else will have to answer Mindy's question about the exact turnaround time for working as an RN. Um, we do not provide specific support for job placement after you complete the program. I know that's common in undergraduate schools to have like an office of place of like a placement office or something. We don't do that, but, or I should say, and your entire clinical experience is essentially an interview for a future job, whether it's at that same site or at another site. And so your clinical faculty will coach you in sort of when it's time to start fishing around for um, job opportunities and how to make all the relationships that you develop as you put together your clinical plan and do your clinical hours, how to um, make those also essentially serve as a job interview um, in terms of how you make those connections in your home community. Okay, uh, the differences, oh yeah, this is a huge one. The differences in the roles of the WHP and CNM. This is very similar. This is, they are very similar and this is a very common question. We even have people get to frontier bound and they're not sure which one they wanna do. So don't freak out if you think that might be you. You can decide which one you think you want to do, apply to that program. And even once you get to Frontier Bound, we can talk about it more. So the WHNP and the Certified Nurse Midwife have almost identical roles in the outpatient setting. So both Women's Health NPs and Certified Nurse Midwives do prenatal and postpartum care and do uh, gynecologic or well-person care throughout the lifespan. There are two things that WHNPs do that midwives don't do, but I think these are uh, coming soon in the W in the midwifery scope of practice. But right now, WHNPs do gender affirming health care and abortion care in all fifty states as long as it's consistent with state legislation. Um, and nurse midwives do those things in many states, but not all, because the Nurse Practice Acts are written differently for those two different roles. So if you're sure that you know, the main thing you want to do is abortion care or gender affirming hormone care. I would probably do the WHNP. Um, but if you want to do those things and you also want to attend labors and birth, I would look into the um, Nurse Practice Act for your state. So then nurse midwives, in addition to doing all those things outpatient, also take care of people in labor and birth in an inpatient setting, whether that's hospital, home, or birth center. Um. There are a variety of reasons why people choose one or the other. Some of them are lifestyle. Um, you know, if you are WHNP, you're probably working in an office Monday through Friday. So if you love your 312s lifestyle, you know, that might not be for you. But a lot of nurse midwives work nights or work 60 hours a week. And that also might not be for you. Rachel, unfortunately, there is not an option to do both tracks at the same time. And that is that dual program is to my knowledge, going away almost everywhere because state boards of nursing are now requiring a unique 750 hours in each track. So if you were to do a dual program somewhere, that would be 1500 clinical hours, um, which would be kind of brutal. And some people do it. Another way to do it would be to get one of those degrees while you're here and come back for a postgraduate certificate afterwards for the other one. Um, do, do. I don't know the answer about statistics before starting, so I'll let somebody else answer that. Whew, 
I know I'm a fast talker, y'all. Okay, coming up for air. Next slide when you get a chance, please, Quincy. Scholarships. Okay, you do have to be here for uh, 24 credits before you can get internal scholarships. That's just because we want to know you're in. You know, you're all in, and then we start funding your education to um, or offering that opportunity for funding to help keep you going. We also have some grant-funded scholarships that are available in addition to um, some of the things that you see here. Next slide, please. Um, Michaela, if you are sure that you wanted to do women's health and midwifery, I would do midwifery first. A uh, postgraduate certificate in women's health after you do midwifery is four terms, so a year. Um, it would be longer if you go the other direction because there's more midwifery courses than women's health courses uh, because you've got the your intrapartum component. Okay, clinical outreach and placement. Ooh, Caitlin, do you want to give me a chance to catch my breath and you want to talk about this one? I'm putting you on the spot. I would be more than happy to. <laughs> yes. You all are asking great questions, so keep these up for sure. But um, what we do as clinical advisors, it's really kind of a unique service that we offer. And I will say that it's what has made, honestly, Frontier just stand out in my, in my estimation from other universities nationwide. We will assist you in finding clinical placement through a number of different um, avenues. We do utilize some super special resources that Frontier has access to. We have a community map that actually hosts 18,000 providers with their contact information. Um, when you set a meeting with your clinical advisor, we can actually see if those preceptors have students coming down the pike. Um, it's, it's very tailored, the service that we offer in clinical outreach and placement, and we will ensure that your goals are met, your specific goals. I know for some of my WH students, you may be, um, you may be specifically interested in gender affirming care. We utilize GLMA um, and a number of different resources just to make sure that your clinical experience is special and that it's tailored to your wants and needs. So you will have your own dedicated clinical advisor, handy dandy clinical advisor, and we'll be here for you throughout, um, throughout your time, throughout your journey. We suggest that you meet with us early and often, and you'll see us at Frontier Bound and we'll start our journey together. Do you all have any questions about clinical outreach and placement or what we do as a department? Okay, well, I will pop my email address in the chat. And if you have questions later and you think of them, you are more than welcome to shoot me an email and I can help. Thank you. Rachel's asking, can we have more than one preceptor? I'm going to answer that and then I'll pop back over to the slide. Absolutely. And you will have more than one preceptor because if you only have one preceptor and that person like has to stop for some reason, you would be stuck. So um, we do um, ask that you have a limited number of sort of primary preceptors. So you're not with somebody different, you know, every week so that somebody can observe your growth and development and give you meaningful feedback but you will have multiple sites and preceptors overall. And we definitely help you with that. Um, and then similar question, Kayla, do we need more than one clinical site? Kind of the same thing. Like it just sort of depends what one site means to you. Like I have a student right now who's with one group of three midwives, but they go to four offices and one hospital. So she's kind of with one group and one site, but she goes to different physical locations and she's with like three or four midwives. Um, and we also love to see you have, you're obviously going to have both a hospital and a clinic on your plan to complete your hours, but we love to see you have out of hospital experiences. So birthing centers, home birth sites, um, we send those through credentialing every day. And Chelsea, just to very quickly answer your question about the community map, it is propri proprietary. So as soon as you are a sitting student, day one, hour one, you will have access to that community map and um, have a chance to start contacting those preceptors. So not ahead of time, but as soon as you are a frontier student, you will. And Gabrielle, for the WHNP students, most students will be outpatient only, but there are WHNPs who work um, inpatient labor triage or on the postpartum floor or a variety of other settings that might be inside a hospital. And so that's also okay. Um, but you're not required to have a hospital setting. 
the midwife students are required, as Caitlin said, to have a hospital site. Even if you do the majority of your births in an out of hospital setting, you do have to have a handful of births in the hospital setting just for your own marketability later. If you already have a master's, um, so a little bit different. If you have a, if you just have a straight up master's in nursing, but you're not an advanced practice nurse, um, that will not affect your program of study. But if you're an advanced practice nurse, meaning you're a family nurse practitioner, you're a psych nurse practitioner, you're a pediatric nurse practitioner, something like that, then you will come in as a postgraduate certificate student. Okay, so over to the team here. Dr. Eileen Thrower is the chair of our Department of Women's Health and Nurse Midwifery. I'm the clinical director. Um, then within our department, there are dozens of course coordinators and course faculty. Like I said, we have right now 29 regional clinical faculty all over the country. Each student is assigned an academic advisor and a clinical advisor. We have financial aid officers, credentialing coordinators, and then we have nice people from the library and IT in our little photos there. So we really went all out. <laughs> all right. Can we do clinicals with some of the provi providers we work with? Sort of. Um, you cannot work as a labor and birth nurse and do clinicals at the same time on that same unit. But there are lots of nuanced situations that are similar to that that we can work with. Um, this, you will see this slide again, uh, I guess I was going to say, do we attribute it somewhere? So we need, we owe this doghouse diaries some money or at least a frontier t-shirt because we use this slide a lot. Um, there are definitely lumps and bumps in your journey. Um, but we are here to support you and, and that's what we're talking about here tonight. Next slide, please. So I know some of you are asking about this and getting responses in the chat. The degree options that we offer here at Frontier is a master's, a postgraduate certificate for folks who are already an advanced practice nurse in another specialty, and we offer the doctor of nursing practice. Um, our terms are 11 weeks long with two weeks in between. So we have four terms a year, just like yield quarter system that's mostly gone away in undergrad, but we have four terms a year. Um, it'll take you two to three years to do your first master's, one to one and a half years to do your postgraduate certificate, and a year and a half to do your doctorate. And the admissions criteria you can read here. Um, you you can uh, request an exemption for the COVID vaccine if that's important to you, and you only need that initial vaccine to apply. You don't need to... Um, demonstrate that you've had every subsequent vaccine. But keep in mind that most clinical sites are going to have that same requirement. So we're kind of gatekeeping to help you be successful in finding a clinical site. Um, let me look up here a little bit more. Sorry, I had to peel a cat off my desk. Um, I've already taken, yes, yeah, somebody in admissions, Brittany, will be able to talk to you about what how you transfer courses. I think that's what you're asking. Next slide, please. Um, again, to be a postgraduate certificate student, you, you need to be an advanced practice registered nurse. So if you have a master's in nursing, but it's in education or leadership or something like that, that does not make you eligible to be a postgraduate certificate student. You would need to be an advanced practice nurse in another specialty for that to make sense. And you can read here the PGC admissions criteria. So Nessie, um, you would have to meet one of these criteria to be um, eligible to do the postgraduate certificate program. You have to already be an advanced practice nurse practicing in one of these other specialties. Next slide, please. Okay, so even though you'll be, you know, at home or at the library or at Starbucks or wherever when you're doing your courses, you're not alone. We do create a community for you. That is part of um, why we have you come to campus is to really get established and create the scaffolding for the community that you'll need to support you through your program. So you will not be alone out there, even though it's distance education. Next slide, please. Okay, here's the deadlines, application info. Next slide. 
Um, so speaking more specifically to the clinical experience, um, something we didn't say from the outset here is that unlike probably any other program you're looking at, you do all of your coursework at Frontier first. So you come to Frontier Bound, then you do all of your classes with papers and tests and all that kind of stuff that, um, from home. Then you come to campus again and do your skills intensive, and then you go do all your clinicals. So what? by the time you get to clinicals, you're not taking any other classes anymore. There are some assignments that you do in clinicals, but it's not like you're in your GYN class and you're going to GYN clinicals. All your classes are done. There's a line in the sand. You come back to campus. And when you go home, you start clinicals and you're all in with clinicals. So um, for no matter whether you're MSN or PGC, you need 750 clinical hours to um, do the women's health NP or to do the nurse midwifery. And it's not just about knocking out that number of hours. There are minimum visit types and you have to do what's called reach competency. This is competency-based education. So you have to um, do the minimum number of hours, the minimum number of visit types, and achieve competency. Now, we've developed that particular number of hours and that particular number of visit types because that aligns with achieving competency for the vast majority of students. But it's not like you can just say, I did my hours, now let me out. You know, you have to show, you have to demonstrate that you can do those things in the way that a safe beginning clinician would be expected to do them. Um, Chelsea is asking, can we get a book list prior to being accepted? I am not aware of that being available, but the number of books is actually pretty minimal. There's maybe three to five books. You would purchase the whole entire program. The rest of it is going to be accessible through the library or through PDF downloads. There's a movement in higher ed to not saddle students with what you might have experienced as an undergraduate, which is hundreds of dollars in textbooks every term. Plus, you're going to be using the same resources really throughout your program. So it's not astronomical. You need the same GPA to apply for any of the tracks. Um, okay, next slide, please. This is our beautiful campus where we have a lot of fun and we eat good food and we have a big slumber party. But if you hate all that, you don't have, I mean, you do have to come to campus, but you don't have to be social if that seems scary to you. But we try to really make it not scary. Next slide, please. Um, okay, that's how you get follow-up info. And was that our last slide, Quincy? Oh, okay, yeah. The whole thing is questions. All right, so we can take down the slide deck um, and just see each other if you want to come on camera. And we will answer more questions. Okay, so if you were trying to keep up with reading the chat and look at the slides and listen to me yammer, you're probably pretty overloaded. So feel free to verbally ask more questions or put new questions in the chat. And, and I'm trying my best to keep up. <laughs> so bear with me folks, but I will uh, post our information for admissions as well. Yeah, and I think I've kept up, but it's totally plausible that some things just zipped by and I didn't see them as we started replying to other things. Me too. If you guys want to come off mute and ask anything, please feel free to do so. Hi, I have a question. Um, is there, I just remember in undergrad, there was like stuff associated with being first full-time or part-time. Is that the case with this program? Like, it, is it, like, if I go full-time and then can't keep up with it, um, can I just easily switch to part-time without losing, you know, opportunities, if that yeah. makes sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we have students change their, what's called a degree audit, which kind of fluctuates and changes as you speed up or slow down. We literally have students do that every day. And that's because this is all advanced practice. So you're all, you are all working nurses. Um, you probably have families, you have other obligations, and we understand all of that. So speeding up and slowing down is par for the course at FNU and, and we'll work with you. 
Thank you so much. Okay, I got a new one here. Oh, I love it. Kelly, keep coming. We'll say hi every quarter. <laughs> I was going to unmute, but I'm, all my kids are here, so they're kind of like, mm -hmm. you hear screeching, that's why. <laughs> we all do our best work with kids in the background, trust okay. me. <laughs> so yeah, I'm excited. I, like, I've listened to this, like I think, for the third time because now I'm out, I'm out of nursing school. I'm working in labor and delivery now, so I'm getting closer, getting, getting some experience. But yeah, I'm so excited. I love listening to these sessions and dreaming and thinking about the future. So thanks for hosting. Well, we're excited to have you. You would be an ideal student, ideal candidate. I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Um, for applications, what is the time frame from submitting your application to finding out if you have been accepted or not, or is it just on a rolling basis? And yeah, I could chime in. So once the applications move to the admissions committee and faculty on average, it's about three to four weeks, but it can be up to about five weeks from submitting all the required documents for review. Okay, perfect, thank you. You're welcome. And if everybody has their questions answered, you're not trapped here. <laughs> but we are happy to uh, to keep going for anything else that you have. We've got about 15 more minutes. Hi, this is Victoria Metzger. Um, hi. hi. I was told that y'all do rolling admissions. Do y'all still have openings for the January 2025 start date? Yes, yeah, We're, the current term is winter, so the application deadline is September 25th. So as long as application submitted, all documents are in by the 25th, then it would be still in consideration for winter, which does begin uh, January 6th of next year. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And I will just to chime in, I'm gonna post the information for admissions as well so if anybody has further questions or need us needs assistance certainly a uh, call email text whatever works best for your schedule and sheila i'll respond to yours so all of the clinical hours for um with the women's health np program are let me think of a different way to say this. You don't have to get a separate primary care preceptor or like go to a primary care site you will get your primary care for both midwifery and for women's health NP within the context of taking doing well person visits and doing uh, pregnancy care. Because people who come for well person visits and people who are pregnant have primary care concerns. So you, your preceptors will all be nurse midwives, women's health NPs, physicians, and maybe family NPs. You don't need to like have a separate like urgent care or... Um, primary care specific site. Yeah, Sheila, I actually just went for my well woman visit. I had a WHMP, my WHMP, who's amazing, but I also had this funky like rash thing and she prescribed mupirocin. So it kind of, you know, that would, that would fall. There you go. <laughs> Real world example, right, Dr. Freed? Hi there, I have a question. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, go yeah. ahead, Melinda. Yeah, Sorry. go ahead. Um, so so far, I've been I've been uh, applying for the women's health NP, but you guys mentioned something about maybe doing the CNM first and then the postgraduate um, NP. So if I were to think about it again and apply for the winter, should I go for the CNM? I work as a as an OB float. So I do both mother, baby, labor and delivery, triage nursing. 
So, you know, nobody except you can know which, what your ultimate goal is, obviously. But what I was trying to say is if you're thinking to yourself, someday I want to do both, I want to be a midwife and I want to be a women's health nurse practitioner, then you should do the midwifery program first. There's less repetition if you do it that way. Um, but if you want to be a women's health nurse practitioner, then just do the women's health nurse practitioner track. Oh, I got you. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Elle is asking, how long does the post-grad certificate for WHNP take? So at this moment in time, if you were a nurse midwife right now who had graduated from our program and you decided you wanted to come back and be a WHMP, it would take four additional terms. We are just keeping up with 50 state boards of nursing and 51 if you count DC. So I can't promise that if you, you know, start our program in 2026 and in 2029, you want to come back and be a WHMP, I can't promise it's going to be the same story. But my best guess is if you finish midwifery, it'll take you four terms to do WHMP after that, which is a year. And do you have to wait a term like DNP? You do, because you have to graduate from one program to apply to the next. We we currently don't have a way for students to be enrolled in two programs at the same time. Um, but I would argue that that's good for you because you'll want to go take boards and start practicing. Um, probably good to come up for air for a minute in between. I have a question. Wait, let me, sorry, uh, Rachel, just a second. Sheila, you're saying after graduating with WHNP, it would be 600 additional hours of clinical. What do you mean additional after what? For DNP, 500 for DNP. After any, the DNP is 500 clinical hours period, no matter what else you've already done. Okay, uh, Rachel, go ahead. So I'm doing um, the midwifery program. I've already, I start in the fall. So if the two midwives that I have kind of, you know, tentatively scheduled to be my preceptors. Uh -huh. um, if for some reason, like I'm not able to get my full competencies, like from office visits, can a woman's health nurse practitioner precept me for those parts, yes. like that section of my clinicals? Yes. Okay. So I'll get, I know one of those and I'll reach out to her and get her on board. <laughs> Sounds good. I love it. <laughs> Thank you guys. Yeah, look at you planning ahead. Very impressive. <laughs> You're making Caitlin's job easy. <laughs> Hello, I have a question. Yeah. Um, after the winter term, when mm -hmm. is the next application deadline? That's a Richard question. <laughs> yeah, so the um the deadline for winter, September 25th, and then the next term spring of 2025 that application will officially open on September 26th. And then the deadline to apply for spring is January 8th of next year. And then spring of 2025 begins April 7th of well next year. And um, I'll post that in the chat as well, if you'd like that link for the upcoming terms. Sure, thank you. So September 26th, I can apply for spring, which will start April 7th. Yes, miss. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yep. September 26th, that spring application will open up officially. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're correct. Very welcome. Sheila, I'm not sure. Somebody else jump in if I'm wrong. I'm not sure that you can find the preceptor requirements um, somewhere before you're enrolled, but I can tell you that um, if you're going into nurse midwifery, your primary preceptor needs to be a nurse midwife. If you're going into women's health NP, your primary preceptor should be a women's health NP. Um, there are some nuances to that, but that would be the basic takeaway. Um, every preceptor needs a minimum of one year in practice. Not one year since graduation, but one year in practice. Hi, can I ask a question, please? Yeah. Hi, Bailey. Hi, um, so I just wanted to check, um, my question's probably for Richard. Um, why is it that one year of experience isn't required until the start date, but the BSN is? I have four years of experience and I was hoping to start in January, but my uh, BSN courses don't end until, I think it's like the first week in October. So, I mean, I'll be done with my program prior to starting the program, starting the master's program, but 
Can I get some clarification on that as to why it's different? Yeah, in regard to the required documents, the admissions committee and faculty, they need all official transcripts for all completed nursing degrees with a conferral award date, cumulative overall GPA posted. So unfortunately, if that's beyond the, um, the deadline for any term, then the application wouldn't be considered for that term until those official transcripts with awarded conferral data are um, officially posted on the transcript. And that's not something I can send over after the fact? Unfortunately, no, not un unofficials can't be used as a placeholder. Um, so those are required, the official transcripts, yeah. I could send over official transcripts, it just wouldn't have the last class. And then that, unfortunately, depending on the school, it would need the award and conferral date because that's when we submit the applications for review that's required. So your transcripts for your BSN would need that information listed on it. Okay. And if you have questions, definitely um, please reach out to us in the missions. I posted the information if you have further questions or need more clarity on that. Yeah, I just, I just think it's odd that you don't have to have the one year of experience prior to application because to me, that's an incomplete application as well. Um, so I don't know why that can't be verified at a later date, like the one year would also be verified. Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, I, I certainly do. Yeah, it's um, just a criteria that needs to be followed. I'm not sure if anybody else could chime in, but uh, that's the policy that we do follow. I've the why for that is probably bigger than the folks on this call are able to answer. Okay, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Um, I am just looking back here. Michaela's asking. Okay, so big picture. I know Caitlin and I have both responded to some of this. The like who exactly can be my preceptor is a bigger question than we're going to be able to answer during this call. But your primary preceptor should be somebody in the same specialty that you're training for. You can also have a women's health NP, a midwife, a family nurse practitioner, and a physician. I'm being attacked by a cat, just like you guys have your babies there. My babies are grown, but the cats are not grown. Um, so that's the short story is there's lots of other folks who can round out your precepting, but your primary preceptor should be in the role that you're training for, because you're going to learn, there is a lot of skill overlap between physicians and PAs and midwives and nurse practitioners, but they're not the same role. So, um, you need to be with, uh, your primary preceptor needs to be the same role that you're training for. Other nurse practitioners and physicians can round that out. You cannot be with a PA and you cannot be with a um, midwife that is not a certified midwife or a certified nurse midwife. Um, yes, Sheila, I understand these. So this is a common concern. Um, there are some ways that we might, yeah, Caitlin is saying, Caitlin and I both frequently work with students in that situation. So some options, I, this is again, bigger than, tonight, but some very broad ideas are um, clustering all of your clinical time together and taking a leave from your workplace, getting assigned to a different unit at work, clustering all your IP hours together and going out of town to get them. Um, this is not an unheard of situation. So we're used to kind of working with that. Um, and L, you're asking a great question. I'm using this word primary. What does that really mean? For the purposes of this call, I'm going to say it means more than half of your clinical time. But because, especially in midwifery, largely in women's health also, but especially in midwifery, because schedules are so unique in terms of like on call versus staffing in the hospital and all this stuff, what it means to like be with a preceptor for amount of time is also a bit muddy. So that's why you have a clinical advisor and a regional clinical faculty person to work with you one-on-one -on -one with the preceptors that you're going to work with in your community to help make a plan that works for you and help you fill in any gaps. So these are all really valid questions, but a lot of them are very nuanced and individual. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions.
Back to you, Richard. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here because I don't know these answers. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me. Yeah. Was there a question, a new one in the chat? I'm still going through the line oh, here. Yes. But when's yeah. the next application? Yeah. That's the next application requirement. So the current term being winter of 2025, the application deadline is September 25th. That is the very, very latest to get application in and then all the required documents submitted for review. And I could, uh, I'll post that as well if you'd like. Oh, and then coursework, my apologies. Coursework then begins January 6th of 2025. For admitted students and then spring yeah if that was the additional question the spring application that will open up september 26th the deadline to apply for spring of next year is january 8th and then coursework for admitted students for spring of next year begins april 7th And was there any other questions that I could address here for admissions? With the transcripts, do it need to show the actual GPA on there? Yes, miss, yeah. Overall cumulative GPA does need to be reflected. Yeah, along with award conferral date as well. Okay, and they don't have to be sealed or special sent to you guys. We can send them to you guys when we apply or electronically sent to you guys? Yeah, if the school allows electronic release, that's fine, yes. Yeah. yeah, that would be acceptable. Mm -hmm. But is this something that I could submit on my own? Like, if I when I get them from my school, do you guys, because mm -hmm. I know some places make them, you know, sealed and transferred. Uh, is that something? Yeah. It is, yes. Yeah. So you could have them, and I'll post this in the chat too. You could, if they release electronically, you could have them sent to FNU admissions at frontier.edu. And then if, because unless they only physically mail the transcripts, the school that you completed your education from, I'll post the physical mailing address in the chat as well. It just depends on the institution and how they operate with their transcripts. Okay. So either one, yeah. To answer okay. your question, yeah, a student could order them on their own behalf if they'd like, yeah. Okay. And any other questions? You. Yeah, you're welcome. Linnea, you're asking how many credit hours are there currently in the nurse midwifery program? I'd have to pull up the program of study because it's had some changes recently. I don't know off the top of my head. It's yeah, it's hi, 55 there. credits. For the nurse midwifery program, it's currently 55 credits to completion. Thanks for didactic. That's the didactic hours. That in, that's all the credit hours for the whole program of study. Do you so, have a course example breakdown um, to show like these are the classes you would take this semester, this semester, this is how many credits each one are that you could share with us? Yeah, so that language is on the website, and I believe the words you're looking for are pro sample programs of study. Um, and I can pull that up real quick and put a link in the chat. Yeah, I could post it as well if you'd like, because, oh, yeah, yeah, the program of study guides, they're posted. I could, um, I'll post that, and then I'll get back to the um, physical mailing address for the official transcripts as well. Thank you. I appreciate that info. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. All right. Well, I think we're out of time. Um, we've shared a couple ways that you know how to reach out to us with future questions. And we'll look forward to hearing from you and seeing some of you if you decide this is the right next step.